Hello, and uh, welcome to this virtual case session nine, Complex PCI. I'm Dr. Francisco Jose Ayala from the University of Chile Clinical Hospital, and I'm joined today by a distinguished faculty members. Welcome, everybody. We got a great session today where we are going to be looking for important topics for us in interventional space with real life challenging cases in our daily practice that will be shown by the presenters. Again, welcome everybody, mm -hmm. and we hope you will enjoy this academic session. Without further delay, I introduce my co-chair, Dr. Seung Ho from Ken Jung University, Dongsan Medical Center, Korea, and the panelist, hey. Ryoji Koshida from Toyoyashi Heart Center, Japan. Kisup Lee from the Catholic University of Korea and the Anjun St. Mary Hospital, Korea. Shi He O Piao from the second affiliated hospital of Owen Shou Medical University, China. Uh, Dr. Seon Ho will introduce each lecture before the presentations. We have approximately one hour for the online session and please keep the time allocated for the presentations. Uh, Dr. C. Unho, please uh, start uh, with the presentations. Okay, so thank you, uh, Dr. Rikumi. And uh, <clears throat> it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, each presenter and titles. So we have the six uh, presenter. I'd like to introduce the first presenter, uh, Dr. Takuma from Japan. His title is, How do you manage it? Dr. Takuma, please. I'm from the Nago Exeka Hospital. I have no disclosure. And uh, the case was uh, 55 years old with the uh, RCCTO. The CTO was uh, very long, the proximal to the distal PD. And uh, she showed that uh, very good collateral from the uh, septal branch and also AC channel. So I started the primary regular approach from the first septal with the Corsair. And, uh, but the uh, septal channel from the uh, UV3 was couldn't pass the retrograde. So I changed to the uh, AC channel. So, but the uh, uh, kind of a chip injured the H channel with perforation like this. But the SO03 could pass to the distal PDA. However, the, it, it was difficult to the proximal PDA. So I uh, performed the balloon screening method from the septal branch like this. And after the trapping the chip of the wire and Topping the uh, cover, and penetration was started from the red artery with the glass. So after that, the uh, anti-grade uh, nacroya and red grade nacroya technique was uh, performed, and the guide extension reverse cut was performed like this. However. I uh, can show my eyeballs. I will show that uh, some problem, big, big problem. So this is a, a distal PD branch. So, and uh, I show you the more proximal site of the, the CTO. So inside the CTO, the very huge uh, hematoma was observed. And uh, furthermore, the a part of the uh, sheet of segment, the guide wire exists uh, outside vessel. You can see like this. So the uh, vessel structure was observed in the uh, one clock. So the uh, guide wire exists uh, outside the vessel. So in this current situation, show that this right. So the retrograde wire uh, shortcut the distal PDPA branch perforation 
Furthermore, the inside the CTO, the vessel, uh, guide wire uh, exists outside the vessel. So it means uh, if the stent was implanted uh, with this guide wire position, the, it's uh, have a risk of the perforation and the losing the four disturbed PDA. So I performed the uh, retrograde uh, rewiring with anti-grade I was guiding. So I was guided uh, retrograde wire was performed and uh, once more the reverse cut was uh, performed. So it's a shame of the, this case. So anti-grade I was guided retrograde wire rewiring was uh, succeeded to externalize second attempt. So this is uh, I was for the second attempt. So you can see the second guide wire was observed in the seven o'clock. So the second guide wire uh, track uh, inside the vessel. Like this. And uh, after that, uh, four, five DS was stented in the, into the CTO. So finalized was a good outcome like this. So uh, discussion point one is the uh, importance of the retrograde channel selection for the uh, retrograde wiring. So coaxiality is very important for the penetration. So next is uh, the utility of the balloon screen or anchoring or trapping for stabilizing retrograde system like this. And the uh, third is uh, I was guiding retrograde wiring. So at this, part, uh, at this situation, the anterograde, the huge uh, dissection was occurred. However, uh, the distal port part of the CTO uh, have less uh, trauma. So the, we can get the more uh, controllability for the guide wire uh, from the retrograde. So the retrograde rewiring with anterograde diverse guidance is uh, useful by that complication. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Takuma. Uh, thank you for your good case. Is there any question and uh, comment for this case? The first, uh, I would like to ask Dr. Uh, Takuma. Yeah. Thank you for your nice uh, uh, case and the uh, successful result. So in this case, the main po point is uh, how you can uh, recanalize the second wire under the anti-grade IVS guidance. Yeah, it's yeah, a very a, yeah point. Yeah, the it's the same as the uh, anterior divers guidance. Uh huh. Yeah, it's uh, actually the you can you can uh, perform the divers guided wiring from the anterior, but uh, it's the same with the uh, uh, retrograde. So the important is uh, 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 understand the divers image with uh, core registration with uh, uh, angiography. Okay. So it's a very key point for the uh, I guess guiding wiring. In, in this case, uh, how you can decide the angiographic, uh, the LAO or RAO or uh, how? Uh, uh, how RAO coder and the LAO cranial. Mm -hmm. And then the second guide you can manage it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That direction, right? Yeah. Mm, uh, that's a very important point. Uh, Dr. Takuma, yep. uh, could you please uh, explain us uh, uh, why did you choose first the, uh, the, the retrograde approach and then uh, you went uh, by the anti-grade approach? Uh, it's because uh, the images of the cusp, the long of uh, this uh, vision, the, the, uh, uh, whatever, uh, please explain us your technique. Yeah, but uh, as far as the, the scepter is very matured, so the the risk of the retrograde is very low. So I set up the primary retro, retrograde approach because of the very long CTO and the ambiguous uh, CTO course, vessel course. So however, the, I cannot uh, perform the uh, retrograde wiring with the intermediate guide wire, like uh, Gradius or UV3. So 
Uh, after that, I changed to the um, anti-grade approach. However, the anti-grade approach was all failed with a very uh, severe classification. So I switched to the retrograde uh, once more with the uh, AC channel. Hi, uh, Dr. Takuma. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your uh, interesting case and uh, successful result. Uh, I think uh, uh, before uh, stent implantation, I was uh, guided. Uh, this decision making was uh, very excellent and important. If there, uh, if you uh, just a PC uh, stent implantation, uh, uh, just not uh, seen. Uh, I was finding uh, it makes the uh, very digester. Yeah. 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 Right. Very. Very nightmare. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah, I learned uh, uh, your case from your case. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Takuma. Yeah. Uh, so, Next time. Uh, <laughs> I know the Dr. Takuma too. That's all. Yeah. He's very enthusiastic yeah. and a maniac yeah. for intervention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I'd like to check the, your selection of the uh, anti-grade guide wire for knuckling. Yeah, uh, anti-grade knuckling wire is uh, used by the Gradius MG. Gradius. So, however, the at this time the this guide wire is not approved in the uh, yeah, Japan okay, with uh, coronary. So maybe the, the Gradius MZ is uh, uh, has a strong support. Yeah. Support. So maybe sometimes um, maybe uh, I I don't use it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe maybe the sort of um, maybe anti grade guide or you go out the vessel, right? Maybe or the retro retro grade, grade guide wire uh, go outside. Mm, okay. So okay. So add one option uh, from the uh, retro grade guide wire. So using the septal. So yeah. I, uh, I'd like to try to the, cross the septal channel, uh, dual lumen micro cassidy. Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. and one, one guide wire uh, go into. Yeah. Uh, actually, the, the, I didn't show this uh, slide, so, but uh, I tried uh, actually the septal branch with uh, Sasuke dual lumen caster mm -hmm. or the balloon screen technique. However, mm -hmm. the, I didn't Can show I this slide, but, but uh, I, I cannot, uh, Penetrate the CTO retrograde okay. neither. Thank, Thank you. you. And, yes, and uh, and one more. So the yeah. uh, septal, septal channel is uh, very mature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah very, so very, very. so the exercise is uh, yes. even the two. Old. Yeah. So, so the um, sometimes try to the retrograde uh, system, the two system. So one system for the PR and one system, and for the CTO. So the two uh, two micro cassidy and the guide wire uh, within the PD artery. So maybe they extended the mm. uh, segment. Of, um, uh, sorry, so bifurcation curve. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So is there more questions? Uh, Dr. Takuma, uh, I had uh, the last question. So yeah, yeah. Why you use uh, the balloon uh, screening uh, techniques? Yeah. So, uh, uh, what size of the balloon? Two uh, O. Oh, two O. Usually yeah. you use two O. Two O. But uh, no, no, no. It depends on, it's, it's depend on the the vessel size of the uh, PDPL size. Yeah. So, it's uh, this PDPL size is very large. So, however, but the larger one is uh, very traumatic. So I hesitate the. Uh, to 2.5, so okay. I, I hesitate. And also the using that techniques, so what, uh, which kind of wire is uh, the pre preferred to the, the balloon uh, protection technique? Ah. So guide, the retrograde guide wire. Uh, maybe any, any, anyone is okay, but uh, uh, I use the uh, Sion Blue in this case. Mm -hmm. So okay. about the uh, AC channel, for AC oh, channel, okay. I choose uh, SO03. Oh. Okay, thank you. So okay. is there any questions? Yes. Uh, no, no, no. Thank you very much, Dr. Okay. Takuma, for this educational case. Uh, uh, I think we have to move uh, forward Hi. to look at the next case because of the time. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Seon Ho? Yes. Uh, I'd like to introduce the second uh, presenter. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mitriv, 
uh, from the uh, the Russia. Uh, his topic, his case is the embolization of the arteries of the raw jaw and the massive bleeding from the aneurysmal bone cyst. Dr. Mitri, please. Uh, my name is Mitri Figur, and uh, it's a great honor for me to speak here. Uh, let me introduce you the report embolization of the artery of the lower jaws with massive bleeding from the aneurysmal bone cyst. Before starting, I would like to inform you uh, we don't have a conflict interest. Uh, aneurysmal bone cysts are uh, non-cancerous tumor-like vascular formation consisting of the filled blood ducts. Although they can found uh, in any bone, they are most often found in the thick lower leg and vertebra. Aneurysmal bone cysts uh, of the lower jaw is an uh, extremely rare, patho rare pathology. By far, the majority of aneurysmal bone cysts are present in the metaphysis of the, of the long bones, about 6-7%. They also occur in the spine, 15% particularly the posterior elements, uh, pelvis, uh, 9%, and less frequently, they can appear in the craniofacial bone and uh, epiphysis. They are relatively rare in the jaw, according, accounting for about 1.9% uh, of all ABCs of skeletons and uh, about 1.5% uh, of all non endotogenic cysts of the jaw. Causes. Uh, vascular malformation is uh, thought to be the cause of uh, aneurysmal bone cysts, but the ultimately cause is unknown. The current thinking is that the vascular malformation leads to increased uh, pressure and expansion in the bone itself, uh, causing uh, erosion and uh, resorption of the involved bone. Most uh, primary aneurysmal bone have a chromosome translocation, which activates sunk again, which stops uh, a cerebroblastic mutation. Uh, treatment, uh, curettage uh, and uh, block excision are the methods of choice. Other modalities include radiation, cryotherapy, percutaneous uh, in intralational injection, calcitonin therapy, and uh, embolization. In that work, we present the case of immobilization of arteries uh, feeding the aneurysmal bone cysts of the lower jaw. Uh, the girl uh, of uh, eight years old turned to the dentist with bleeding from the gum in the area of uh, uh, 4.6 tooth. This tooth was removed by the dentist. After that, start profuse non-stop bleeding from the hole of the extracted tooth. The girl was hospitalized in the central hospital, where was received an embolization of arterial gallaris inferior on the right and the tamponade of the hole of the extracted tooth. After that, before or after that, uh, the bleeding was stopped. When the girl is uh, transferred to a children's hospital for further examination and treatment, upon receipt. Two days later, the patient bleeds again and the surgical treatment is urgently performed for the child. Revision of the hole of the tooth and the vox sponge is applied. Uh, hemoglobin level is uh, 18 uh, gram per liter. The bleeding, bleeding uh, doesn't stop and the patient is transferred uh, to the Republican Center for embolization of blood vessels supplying the kiss. Uh, diagnostic. Uh, according to computer tomography of the facial skull, uh, expensive multiple osteolytic damage to the lower jaw uh, on the right and uh, multiple fluid in the kissing area. According to angiography data, we found a uh, highly uh, vascularized formation, blood supply from the right arterial facialis, and uh, stagnation of contrast. Treatment was performed uh, transfemoral excess with uh, local anesthesia with uh, GR6 French catheter using the Teruma Progriat microcatheter and embolization material uh, PVA 100 micron. Performed select selective embolization of arteria facialis on the right. Because the right arterial bull of the lower jaw always anastomos well with, uh, the, uh, with the left side, 
it uh, was decided to perform selective angiography of the external carotid artery on the left, where found hypervascularized formation on the lower jaw on the right was revealed, abundantly feeding uh, through a network of collaterals from the left arteria alveolaris inferior and left arteria facialis. It was decided to perform uh, selective embolization on the left side. Uh, in this picture, we uh, see uh, the network of collateral from the left to right. Uh, successive selective embolization of uh, these arteries with uh, uh, material PVA uh, 100 micron. Uh, results uh, bleeding from the gum stopped and uh, during the observation in out center for one day didn't review. Uh, bleeding from uh, an unreasonable bone kissed after embolization was not observed, and uh, during extended curettage, uh, blood loss was only 10 milliliters. According to BFC, the formation was an unreasonable bone kiss. After surgery, uh, pain was not observed, bleeding from the gun was not noted. Uh, antibacterial and symptomatic therapy were prescribed. The girl safety discharge and uh, is now is in uh, completely health. Uh, the postoperative result was good aesthetically and uh, functionally. Uh, the operative site was healed with normal bone structure and uh, no additional treatments such as uh, surgical reconstruction or uh, bone graft was necessary. Uh, which was uh, beneficial for young child. Subsequent, uh, uh, subsequent observation consisted of clinical and radiological studies uh, within one, six, and uh, 12 months after uh, the procedure. No, re no relapse was observed. Conclusion. Uh, early diagnosis uh, of uh, uh, and the reasonable case is very important and uh, appropriate uh, treatment should be given, taking into account factors such as age, surgical complication, and the post, uh, uh, possibility of uh, relapse. Uh, to identify an reasonable bone case, the computer tomography method uh, is the best choice. Uh, many after attribute uh, high rates of uh, relapse to incompletely removal uh, during surgery. <clears throat> A problem that can lead to incomplete, incomplete removal is massive bleeding. Uh, Preoperative embolization of the arteries supplying the kist law uh, for safe curettage in the relativity bloodless area. This ensures uh, complete removal of the area, uh, eliminating the likelihood of relapse. And uh, embolization is uh, an effective procedure in the treatment of uh, an reasonable kist and may be included in the main treatment method. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dimitri, for this uh, uh, educated case uh, and uh, infrequent for our practice. And it shows that uh, interventional treatment can be applied for many, many. Uh, 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 situations, uh, and uh, this is a special situation. I want to ask you, why did you choose uh, the femoral root uh, instead of using some of the radial root or whatever we try to use in our days, no, uh, not to be so invasive? This case was an emergency, uh, and uh, we are perform uh, we have performed uh, femoral dose to, uh, uh, very uh, frequently in Russia. Okay. And uh, do you recommend, uh, as uh, I saw in your conclusions, that uh, uh, many of these cases uh, have been to evaluate before and uh, maybe uh, do the embolization before the treatment of the curettage? That is your proposal? Yes, I, I, I'm uh, recommended uh, uh, using embolization uh, before curettage uh, because uh, it's uh, uh, blood loss where uh, blood loss uh, after curettage 
uh, very less uh, than uh, than without embolization. I I think. Okay, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Sun Ho. Okay, so uh, I'd like to introduce the third speaker, uh, Dr. Moshi. Uh, his uh, title is the post MI ventricular septal uh, rupture with heart failure treated successful and uh, transcatheter the device closer. Dr. Mosh, please. I'm Dr. Keshu Murthy, and I will be presenting a rare case of post myocardial infarction ventricular septal rupture with heart failure, which we treated successfully with transcatheter device closure. I have no conflicts of interest. Our patient, a 16 year old gentleman, a tobacco chewer, presented with anginal chest pain of eight hours duration. He was averagely built and nourished, vitals were stable, systems unremarkable. ECG showed ST elevation in inferior leads, ST elevation in lead three more than lead two. Echocardiography showed regional wall motion abnormality in inferior wall in RCA territory. He had an ejection fraction of 50%. He was immediately taken up for primary angioplasty since he was within the window period. Angiography showed mid-segment LAD significant lesion, significant lesion in the LCX, and in the culprit artery RCA from proximal to mid-segment, there was a tubular lesion 90% maximum. The culprit lesion in the RCA was stented with good result. Subsequently, in a staged PCI, angioplasty and stenting to LAD was done with a drug diluting stent with good result. So also, angioplasty and stenting to LCX was done with good result. Subsequent recovery was uneventful. His ejection fraction improved to 60%. There was no regional wall motion abnormality. He was discharged on standard dual antiplatelet drugs, statin, beta blocker, and ACE inhibitor. He remained asymptomatic for next two and a half months. However, later, after two and a half months, he presented with breathlessness, undue fatigue, and swelling of both lower limbs of two days duration. Symptoms were sudden in onset. At this time, on examination, he had tachycardia, tachypnea, hypoxemia, bilateral pedal edema, JVP was raised, he had bibasal crackles, tender hepatomegaly, and pansystolic murmur in left terminal edge. Based on the, these clinical findings, a diagnosis of congestive cardiac failure with a possibility of post-MI ventricular septal rupture was made. Echocardiography showed normal LV function, RA and RV were dilated. Apical four-chamber view showed a large ventricular septal defect for, with left to right shunt. It was located towards the apex, it was epically located, and the maximum diameter was 14 millimeter. He had moderate pH. So a diagnosis of post-MI ventricular septal rupture with left to right shunt with congestive cardiac failure and moderate pH was made in a background of coronary artery disease, triple vessel disease, post-PCI status. He was stabilized with anti-heart failure therapy. It was aggressively managed with diuretics, ACE inhibitors, vasopressors. IABP was on standby. He was discussed with the heart team and it was decided to electively close the ventricular septal rupture after four weeks. After four weeks, he was re-evaluated and chosen for transcatheter closure. Planning of transcatheter closure was done meticulously right from the axis to hardware to AV loop and to the device to be used. We chose right femoral artery and right internal jugular vein for arteriovenous loop because if you come from the femoral vein, right femoral vein, you will have to negotiate two acute bends, one at the tricuspid valve level and the other at the apical ventricular septal rupture level. But if you come from the right internal jugular vein, you will have to negotiate only one bend. And we chose an 18 millimeter device. We oversized the device by four millimeter. Defect was 14 millimeter. This is the LVNG showing a large ventricular septal defect with left to right shunt. It is epically located. We crossed the defect with a thermo glide wire from left to right, place the glide wire in the pulmonary artery and snared from pulmonary artery, brought it out through the right internal jugular vein. This is the arteriovenous loop. Here you can see the catheter has come from the right femoral artery. It is the descending aorta to ascending aorta to left ventricle, 
from left to right ventricle cross through the ventricular septal rupture and the guide wire has been brought out through the uh, right atrium svc and right internal jugular vein so once this av loop was established over this loop nine french delivery sheath was uh, brought in by uh, kissing catheter technique to prevent entanglement in the cordae and the tissue at the rupture site we placed the delivery sheath in the left ventricle we brought in the 18 mm device deployed the left ventricular disc we checked with the hand injection through the pig tail positioned the device exactly at the rupture site pulled it back gently but firmly after confirming the position we deployed and released the device the de device was stable initially there was some residual shunt but it gradually subsided over 10 minutes and subsequently patient recovered without any complication his symptoms of heart failure improved echocardiography showed a well placed device with minimal residual shunt which disappeared pre discharge this is uh, more than one year now after the procedure he remains absolutely asymptomatic he walked to the fields 2 km away and back this is the follow up echo where you can see the device well seated with normal lv function no shunt across a few points for discussion why to close and what happens if we do nothing a ventricular septal rupture we'll see the natural history when should we close the ventricular septal rupture the timing and how to close ventricular septal rupture well, by surgical means or by percutaneous fortunately ventricular septal rupture has become rare after advent of pami less than 1% but 25% of them die with cardiogenic shock within 24 hours the prognosis is grim and 90% of medically managed patients die within 2 months surgical repair in acute stage is difficult because of the friable margins most do not do well and inferior mi ventricular septal rupture is complex has got serpiginous track and has got higher mortality the mortality in general remains high and timing of repair has to be individualized if a patient is unstable he should be supported with the mechanical circulatory devices like ecmo tandem heart elvad and then the definitive surgery should be delayed because if you operate early surgically closed vsrs within 24 hours have a mortality of 60% if you try to close by transcatheter technique the mortality is up to 88% on the other hand if you stabilize the patient for about 3 to 4 weeks and then close the rupture then the mortality is relatively less however there is always a selection and survivor should by us because more critically ill patients generally succumb in the acute stage and those who are slightly better off survive up to 3 weeks if you do not do anything uh, if you manage only medically then the mortality is very high up to the tune of 95% so to conclude ventricular septal rupture is rare but life threatening complication it has got grim prognosis complete revascularization should be done before attempting the closure we have to individualize the timing and modality of closure and one need not chase small residual shunts because they are hemodynamically insignificant and usually close over a period of time thank you for your attention thank you uh, dr keshama mors uh, in for this case is there any question and uh, comments so dr keshama mors so i'd like to ask uh, once since uh, you found uh, this uh, the ventricular septal defect at uh, almost uh, uh, two two months beyond yeah, two, two months right yeah, two and a half months after the yeah. initial event yeah all right okay so uh, do you think uh, that uh, occurred uh, two months later or uh, yeah. the earlier or how do you think uh, absolutely this is a very unusual uh, timing generally right. it has got a bimodal presentation it happens uh, generally uh, early or within a, a few weeks so two and a half months later is a rare occurrence rare oh, occurrence okay, okay. so it generally it doesn't happen right. there are uh, different types of ventricular septal rupture in fact you know becker type 1 2 and 3 the right. becker type 1 happens in the acute stage uh, where uh, you know it is a slit like a tear whereas right. a becker type 2 happens subacutely it is because of the erosion of the the infected uh, myocardium uh -huh. because of the coagulation necrosis and neutrophilic infiltration and shear stress whereas uh, the becker type 3 happens very late due to the uh, the perforation of the aneurysmal uh, part of the myocardium thinned out and aneurysmal so the different uh, types of uh, ventricular septal rupture 
occur at different uh, time line okay so another question is uh did you perform the, the trans aspargyl echocardiogram because uh, uh for the accuracy of the size of the ventricular septal defect the transthoracic echo might be not enough i think so did you perform the, the trans aspargyl echocardiogram as well no, no no sir no we did not perform here the the ventricular septal defect was located little in the apical side of the uh, right. the, the interventricular septum and it was clearly visible on the uh, transthoracic echo so if there was any doubt of the margins or the size then we would have done the transesophageal echo so we did not uh, perform the transesophageal echo okay thank you Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Uh, congratulations for this educational case. Uh, as you say, it's a little bit infrequent to see uh, late uh, uh, ventricular septal ruptures, and the most of them occur in the acute phase. And yes. it's uh, really a problem to just uh, use devices, and also for the surgeons because of the frail margins. And uh, yes. sometimes. Uh, we use uh, these unplugged the devices, but uh, we are not sure that uh, we have to use uh, another unplugged the devices after because uh, sometimes uh, uh, you can uh, find a residual chunk that uh, you have to close again. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, you use a special uh, septal device, this unplugged was for septal rupture or was the, the normal septal device that you use in this case? Sir, we use the normal uh, muscular uh, amplatzer septal uh, device. We did not uh, use the post infarct device. In fact, ideally, post infarct device uh, should be used if it is available because it has got uh, the wider uh, discs, wider discs and longer waist. Whereas the normal muscular device has got a uh, waist uh, length of uh, seven millimeter and the the discs are eight millimeter larger. So we used 18 millimeter device. So uh, it's uh, this LV disc was uh, 26 millimeter. If we had used the post infarct device, the special device, then the, the waist length would have been 10 millimeter and the LV disc would have been little larger uh, up to uh, uh, you know 28 millimeter. So that would have been the ideal one. But since we didn't have the ideal uh, uh, the, the device, we used the muscular device. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Sun Ho. I think we have to move to the next case. Okay, so uh, let's move on to the uh, next speaker, Dr. Uh, Hong Seng Lo uh, from the Malaysia. Uh, his uh, title is the big and the stubborn, the persistent intracoronary thrombus. Dr. Hong Seng Lo, please. Okay, good evening, everyone. It's good to uh, meet up with all of you today to present my case. Uh, the title is Big and Stubborn regarding a persistent uh, intracoronary thrombus. Okay, I have no potential conflicts of interest. Okay, uh, we have a 56-year-old um, male with 40-pack years of smoking and uh, dyslipidemia. He presented to a district hospital about six hours uh, after onset of angina. He was hemodynamically stable. The ECG showed sinus rhythm with uh, ST elevation in inferior leads, suggestive of inferior ST elevation uh, myocardial infarction. Uh, however, there were no cardiac catheterization facility nearby, and hence uh, he was given oral aspirin with clopidogrel, and he was successfully thrombolyzed with the IV uh, streptokinase, and he was then continued on dual antiplatelet therapy with uh, subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin while waiting to be transferred to a cardiac center for early coronary angiogram. Uh, the repeat ECG uh, at the cardiac center shows uh, sinus rhythm and the ST elevation resolved and there was persistent S uh, T inversions in the uh, inferior leads. The echo shows a uh, left ventricular ejection fraction of 50% with inferior and posterior wall hypokinesia. This is the first coronary angiogram performed uh, which is about one week after the onset of uh, myocardial infarction. The normal left coronaries uh, show that the cirques are normal and the left uh, uh, LED is also uh, normal with some collaterals to the distal uh, right coronary artery. However, the angiogram of the right coronary artery shows a complete occlusion 
from the proximal RCA with high thrombus burden with TME thrombus grade 5. This is a diagrammatic uh, representation of a general approach to intracoronary thrombus, which is divided into two uh, therapeutic arms. First is to prevent thrombus propagation or to prevent new thrombus formation. And the second is to restore coronary flow. So to prevent thrombus formation and also propagation, generally we give anticoagulations and antiplatelets. And to restore coronary flow, basically we, uh, if there's ongoing ischemia, uh, we will try to remove the thrombus by various means. However, if there's no ongoing ischemia, we can consider uh, giving antithrombotic therapy and repeat the angiogram later. So uh, we attempted to do a per thrombus aspiration during the first coronary angiogram because uh, the patient was already on antiplatelet, dual antiplatelet and anticoagulation for a week. So the wire crossed the, the thrombus easily and uh, we tried to uh, aspirate the thrombus. There were a lot of thrombus being aspirated. However, despite multiple attempts, we can still see uh, there are a lot of thrombus uh, still in the RCA and uh, we are able to establish uh, some blood flow, which is about TME2. So because of the uh, persistent high thrombus burden, uh, we decided perhaps we should uh, to give anticoagulation, antiplatelet further. So we gave IV glycoprotein 2B3A, which is tirofibin in this case, and it was given for 36 hours. And we also continued on the subcutaneous uh, low molecular heparin, which is fundaparinox in this case, for five days. Uh, he, he, fortunately, he remained stable without any angina during the five days. And we decided to repeat the angiogram five days later. This is the second coronary angiogram. Again, we can see there's a heavy, persistent heavy thrombus burden in the RCA despite uh, 12, uh, despite already 12 days of uh, antiplatelet and anticoagulation. And the TME, uh, the, the flow is only TME1. So uh, we uh, attempted, we attempted again a thrombus aspiration with the export advanced catheter. Uh, again, uh, we failed to remove most of the thrombus. And uh, the, most likely the thrombus are already well organized. They are pretty hard to be aspirated. So what do we do next in this case? We have uh, attempted uh, thrombus aspiration in two different uh, uh, angiogram, uh, angioplasty, uh, but we still fail to achieve a satisf satisfactory result for uh, either intracoronal imaging or even uh, for stenting. Uh, because if we were to, to decide to stand now with uh, so much thrombus in there, uh, we may have a risk of uh, acute stent thrombosis or even an uh, undersized stent. So uh, we decided uh, perhaps we might need to do a perform a mechanical thrombectomy device, but unfortunately, uh, the device was, uh, was uh, broken that day and we couldn't use it. So we have to decide an alternative uh, uh, management for this case. So we had a long discussion with the patient and also with uh, various uh, uh, teammates. Uh, we decided that perhaps we should consider a longer duration of antithrombotic therapy before we repeat another angiogram. So uh, this patient also had a very low bleeding risk score and therefore it is relatively safe for us to consider uh, uh, starting him on a dual antiplatelet therapy with uh, anti uh, oral, direct oral anticoagulation which is Rewarosaban in this case. And the dose was 20 milligram daily for one month. Uh, just uh, for the, the uh, knowledge, uh, there is no guideline regarding this therapy for such a case till date. Uh, he was also not keen for oral vitamin K antagonist or, or subcutaneous uh, low molecular heparin because uh, the, the patient will need to repeat his INR frequently. And also he has to stay in the hospital to, to, to get to continue on the uh, injections. So he decided to be discharged first, continue on the dual antipalate therapy and also the rivarazaban for one month. So after one month, we brought him back. And as you can see, the result is quite amazing. Uh, all the thrombus are already gone. We have pretty smooth vessel. However, there's some moderate disease in the mid uh, RCA. Uh, for the record, we did a, a FFR. And the FFR shows it was a 0 0.98. Therefore, we decided uh, standing was not required at this time. 
So he was actually discharged well on the same day with the dual antiplatelet uh, plus the standard guideline directed medical therapy, and he has been uh, well uh, for his first year of follow up. So for the conclusion, uh, this case actually present uh, uh, dis discuss about a persistent and extensive as well as organized intracoronary thrombus in a patient with a recent inferior STEMI, uh, despite given IV streptokinase, multiple antithrombotic agents, and also multiple attempts of thrombus aspiration. Uh, further intracranial intervention was delayed, uh, allowing for a longer duration of antithrombotic therapy with the APT and direct oral anticoagulant uh, till one month which actually resulted in a complete resolution of the intracranial thrombus. And also uh, in this case, it also prevented uh, uh, unnecessary stenting of the vessel without any significant uh, stenosis. And therefore, this case actually uh, describes that sometimes by doing less, we are actually able to achieve more. So this is in contrary to the previous cases that are being presented by other participants, which involve a lot of highly technical uh, uh, procedures. But ho however, in this case, we only... Uh, prolong the medical therapy, avoid uh, any complicated or complex procedures, and hence we are still able to achieve a good result. But in, uh, we still need further trials or evidence before we recommend this for all cases, uh, uh, of all similar cases of such. Yeah, thank you for your attention. Okay, Dr. Uh, Lowe, uh, very educational uh, case. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, congratulations of your success for uh, the case. So is there any questions and comments? Uh, I think uh, it's a very uh, nice and uh, excellent case, but um, uh, 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 it is uh, some uh, concern because uh, after five days of uh, initial uh, index uh, coronary angiography, uh, the flow was uh, TIMI1. Yes. So if uh, the uh, uh, culprit lesion was... Uh, Carpal lesion, uh, if carpal lesion is LAD or uh, another uh, sock or left main, uh, this is a strategy would be uh, more dangerous. So uh, we should concern about that. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Shang for this educational case. Uh, uh, we understand that this is an off-label indication of DOAX. Eh? Right. And, uh, uh, yeah, there, there, there is uh, some considerations about this case. When you do uh, aspiration uh, with the export catheter, uh, you can also embolize. So this has been shown uh, in some uh, of the trials, and uh, we have to be aware that uh, many of these aspirations uh, could be uh, harmful uh, and uh, uh, may end with a stroke. So um, the recommendation uh, for this case as, uh, uh, was uh, uh, just uh, uh, done by the other panelists, uh, uh, maybe uh, was to extend uh, this case uh, just uh, in the minutes when you have only TIMI1 flow and, uh, and see what happened uh, with that artery uh, and not left uh, only by Doc uh, treatment. Uh, maybe this uh, isn't a successful case, but uh, maybe it's also anecdotal. Uh, that's my comment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very uh, much. Dr. Rowe, uh, how about in this case, uh, in, the, in the long term, uh, how do you think uh, your management for these patients? <laughs> well, uh, the patient, uh, he has a background of uh, smoking and also uh, uh, high cholesterol level. So the, 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 I think the most important is to, to, to advise him to quit smoking and make sure that his cholesterol is uh, really under control. And uh, of course, we will closely monitor him because he has got a moderate disease, still got some moderate disease in the mid-RCA, and there's a possibility that it may progress in the future. So if he has any sign uh, of ischemia or, or, or having any uh, ACS, then we perhaps we may consider to stand uh, the lesion. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason why we didn't uh, uh, balloon and stand in the beginning was because uh, at that moment when we, when we first did the angiogram, the patient no longer had any more angina. There was no uh, evidence, uh, sign of ischemia by then. So we thought we would have to take some time 
to, to give the medical therapy uh, before we decide uh, which, whether we should stand or not. And further, there was so much thrombus, uh, we were not confident that whether when we do any intracranial imaging, or perhaps we may have actually underestimated the size of the RCA, and we might actually put a, a, a smaller stent, and that will be a high risk of uh, a, acute stent thrombosis. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, for the timing, uh, let's move on to the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Dr. Cedar Kastri uh, from the India. Uh, his title is peripheral angioplasty for gangrenous left ring finger with septicemia. Uh, Dr. Kastri, please. Uh, good evening to all of you. I hope uh, my slides are visible. Uh, I have no financial uh, disclosure or conflicts of interest. But this is a 60-year-old male, known diabetic, hypertensive, presented with a history of uh, uh, fever associated with chills and rigors. He had a, a gangrenous changes and a claudication of the uh, left, uh, left forearm. So he underwent PCF LED in 2011 and failed attempts of PCF RCA. Attempted twice, but uh, finally uh, it was uh, uh, they did successful PCA. ECG normal, today for no RWMA, good LV function. Investigation showed uh, lipocytosis and uh, right hand blood culture showed seresia. CT angiogram we did uh, that showed the forearm angiography uh, diminished flow. There is no flow of radial, ulnar, and palmar arch. This is the CT image. You can see very clearly. We are unable to see the radial artery, ulnar artery, and the palmar, like a deep palmar or superficial from digital arteries. So our plan is because he had a gangrenous uh, ring finger, left ring finger with cellulitis and fever, episodes of chills and rigors. Our intention was to uh, establish the blood flow to the hand so that they improve the flow and you just control the infection. The indication was like a limb-threatening ischemia. We have chosen the right femoral approach because the anti-grade approach through the brachial approach may hamper the blood flow further. So that's the reason we avoided the brachial. So the angiogram, uh, we used GR catheter uh, from the right femoral approach. Uh, unable to see any flow in the radial, ulnar, and uh, palmar arch. You can see very nicely. If you see, our intention is to open the, the uh, superficial palmar arch. Even digital arteries, we have to do the balloon angioplasty. Open the right radial, uh, left radial, and the left ulnar artery. This is our plan. So we have taken the JR guiding catheter and turbo wire, and it was placed in the brachial artery. And we took the fielder FC, open four wire using the fine cross. Then we crossed the uh, ulnar artery. And it was dilated with 2 into 120 mm uh, peripheral balloon. And this is the balloon dilatation. Then uh, distally, uh, we took the Tajuna 2 and 2.5 mm balloon, uh, distal portion of the uh, uh, radial artery, uh, ulnar artery, as well as the distal artery was done. The post balloon, uh, we are unable to see any flow. Uh, still, then uh, we did uh, one more dilatation, placing the fielder FC into the distal arteries. And with microcatheter support, you can see the uh, wire, is, uh, wire is placed in digital arteries. And we carried uh, multiple uh, dilatations. You see the digital ulnar artery again dilated with 2 into 8 mm peripheral balloon. And including the digital artery, uh, we dilated all the digital branches from the uh, palmar arch. And, uh, Microcatheter injection, you can see the flow is established. And then you can see the uh, arch, you can see palmar arch, you can see distal arteries, you can see, but subsequently developed slow flow. Then uh, again, redilated with three into 120 mm balloon. And then the uh, dilatations. Then uh, we have retrogradely entered the radial artery uh, through the um, uh, through palmar arch. Then, uh, Palmar arch as well as the radial artery was dilated with 3 to 120 mm PTA balloon. You can see the balloon dilatation. Then um, again, uh, uh, digital arteries are open, palmar arch 
then antegradely again we enter the radial artery using the fielder xt so one by from the radial artery one by from the ulnar artery palmar arch entering into the radial artery then uh, again slow flow notice then we gave intra arterial uh, nicoran and nitroglycerin injections then uh, again antegrade placement then again it was dilate radial artery was dilate 2.5 into 15 mm tazuna balloon up to 10 atmosphere palmar arch and the radial artery was dilated with 2.5 into 120 mm balloon so we have dilated ulnar radial and distal arteries as well as the palmar arch vessels so brachial artery contrast injection uh, after the 200 micrograms of nitroglycerin tmg nicoran then you can see the uh, again it was redilated again so multiple dilatation subsequently then we uh, took the injection then you can see nicely filling uh, palmar arch ulnar artery radial artery including the distal branches you can see the distal branches also you are able to see so there are only few case reports are available there is one series uh, that is angioplasty of the below the elbow arteries for critical limb hand ischemia this is more often observed in patients who are suffering from a renal failure so here in this series uh, they found very clearly the motal rate is low and uh, even the mace rate is very low and they have shown successful results with the healing of uh, limb uh, ischemia relief of limb ischemia there are few reported cases uh, here uh, the patient developed gangrene of the third to fifth fingers and proximal radial artery occlusion where they did the 2.5 into 120 mm balloon dilatation they have put stents also this is the only one case report i saw that stents were implanted but uh, it would be preferable to avoid the stents because the superficial and compression it can muscular compression it can uh, the stents get distorted ideal to do the balloon dilatations if needed you can do the dragulating balloon also and uh, one more report the distal uh, radial artery and they did the angioplasty balloon they used 2 mm balloon and all these cases showed very good patency of the radial and ulnar artery and only one case was uh, uh, they have reported including the uh, palmar arch everything dilated but our case unique in this one we did the ulnar radial and uh, even deep palmar arch as well as the superficial palmar arch as well as the distal arteries were open and then with successful results this is a follow up ct angiogram you can see very nicely uh, this is very well patent though we are unable to uh, see the ulnar radial artery and uh, you can see the superficial deep palmar arch as well as the distal arteries you can see very very uh, clearly well seen so this is the follow up uh, we took the uh, the whatever the uh, because the uh, ring finger the distal portion was gangrenous the last digit was amputated you can see one month later uh, his total relieved of fever the sepsis subsided and recovered remarkably without any clarification now is absolutely this case was done about uh, one year ago uh, even today he is doing very well without any problems so a balloon angioplasty forearm vessels is very much possible and feasible where the clinical situation demands mainly due to occlusion of uh, like radial or ulnar or, or the even arch vessels leading to life threatening ischemic conditions procedure can be performed through antegrade brachial approach or through the femoral approach uh, antegrade brachial approach purposefully we have avoided here because the it may hamper the flow further and it may cause some dissection is there so that the reason we wanted to we went ahead with the femoral approach there no supportive data for usage of stents and deb due to limited uh, experience and limited published re case reports very few cases are reported and it's very difficult to but uh, rational wise you can use a dragulating balloon instead of dragulating stents which can work well adjunct to pharmacotherapy should be recommended for better acute and long term results that is very very important and see if the atheroma is there and adequate antiplatelets these are all very very important suppose if the patient is having atrial fibrillation thrombus is there adequate anticoagulation to prevent such type of events are very very important the hypertension adapt control of the risk factors are very very useful in maintaining the 
long term patency of these vessels thank you one and all for paying me this uh, uh, for paying attention okay uh, thank you dr kastri uh, for your night case uh, is there any questions or comments from panelists okay hi uh, thank you for your excellent case dr kastri um one comment so the this in this case in this patient the no flow or the slow flow phenomenon caused by the microembry so the distal embryization so the sometimes so using the over the wire balloon and the occluded the proximal site and the uh, once the guide wire turning turning out and the uh, and the uh, drug Drug, um, drug in, uh, infusion from the over the uh, over the wire lumen from the occluded balloon. So the uh, high pressure infusion of the sometimes uh, some kinds of the uh, dilated agent, so nitroprusside or so we sometimes use uh, apavarine. So maybe a three or four or five times the repeated. So sometimes the Blood fraud is uh, improving. So, the, in my experience, mm -hmm. that will be useful for if the acute approach is there. This is a chronic condition with the inflammatory approach, it's harnessed. And uh, uh, despite using balloon dilatations, we are unable to maintain the patency because it required almost uh, multiple dilatations. So, if the acute thrombotic occlusion or the, some vasospasm is there, you go distally, put the microcatheter, remove the wipe. And distal, you can give the nitroprusside or even uh, any papaverin, all those drugs you can try. But I think in this case, because the even the small, small distal arteries are closed, the reconstruction of the entire palmar arch and distal arteries is the only way. And subsequently, if the flow is restricted or the vasospasm is there, that time you can maintain these drugs. But this is not because of the uh, thromboembolic phenomena, this is uh -huh. because of the uh, the reason is unknown, but uh, mainly uh, he has a chronic atheroma because uh, previously he underwent uh, death implantation and subsequently he underwent uh, a repeat angioplasty for right coronary two times, two operators struggled for two, three hours. They were unsuccessful. And finally, we could uh, cross and uh, we performed the right coronary. That means he has an aggressive atheroma, maybe because the atherosclerosis, though, which is unusual in the forearm vessels without involving the other vessels, but the LV function is absolutely normal. No rhythm disturbances to explain mm -hmm. thromboembolic cause at atheroma. Maybe because the atheroma unusual site could be the reason for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kasturi, for, the, uh, for sharing this interesting case. And uh, uh, this uh, could be uh, also a uh, uh, way to go for some of uh, the complications uh, when we use radial and ulnar arteries. And uh, uh, most of them, uh, when they get uh, thrombosis, uh, these patients are asymptomatic. But uh, anyway, um, I was thinking we can rescue many of these cases and uh, 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 making uh, this technique uh, uh, very useful. And uh, I want to ask you, uh, why did you choose so long balloons uh, uh, for this case? Uh, is there a recommendation or why did well, uh, for, uh, for any peripheral interventions, we use long peripheral balloons because long balloons, because diffuse long segment lesions because sometimes what happens if you take a small balloon, you have to weave multiple uh, balloon dials. That times the block may shift here and there. Ideal to take the longer balloons, uh, all early. Below knee also we use like a 200 mm, 120 mm, 150 mm balloons so that the entire, the atheroma gets compressed. So peripheral uh, angioplasty requires uh, uh, like a 120 mm, 150, depending on the segment. You can, at a time you can do balloon dilatation. The flow of time will be saved and the maximum lesion can be covered in one or two sittings. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you uh, for the time limitation. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, last speaker. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sapisankar 
uh, from the Indonesia. Uh, his title is uh, Spontaneous Coronary Artery Dissection Complicating the STEMI in Young Woman to Stand or Not to Stand. Uh, Dr. Sanka, please. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. It's my honor to speak here. Uh, today, I would like to share our case, uh, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, complicating is the elevation myocardial infarction, to stand or not to stand. I have nothing to disclose. And here, my case presentation, a female 36 years old with a diagnosis recent stemma anterior. Uh, from the clinical presentation, the patient complained chest pain and performing fibrinolytic at local hospital and then referred to our hospital for further management. She had no history of traditional atherosclerotic risk factor and had history of preeclampsia previously. Uh, her physical examination and laboratory findings uh, were normal. Here, the ECG showed uh, is the elevation uh, with biphasic T wave at anterior precordial lead. We were performing echo with, uh, we found the hypokinetic at anterior segment with the ejection fraction 52%. And then uh, we performed coronary angiography. We can see here the RCA uh, was normal and left coronary angiography uh, showed contrast staining at uh, proximal to mid part of LAD with uh, distal compromise of flow. From the caudal view, we can see here uh, the double man appearance maybe indicate some of our dissection. So what is the next plan? Uh, actually, uh, we decided to manage conservatively uh, at the initial. However, this patient is still complaining uh, chest pain. So we proceed to perform a PCI at LAD. And here the one month uh, later, we can see the coronary angiography show the progression of the disease uh, totally occluded uh, from mid to distal part of LAD. And then uh, we use a uh, floppy wire seven blue with support a microcatheter fine cross to cross the LAD. And we advance uh, the wire carefully. And here the critical point, we have to ensure that the wire is on the distal true lumen. So we make a distal tip injection from microcatheter. We can see the contrast fill on the uh, LAD. And we continue to multiple prior dilatation with a semi-compliance balloon. And then we use OCT to evaluate the mechanism of uh, dissection and guided the next management strategy. From the OCT, we can see here the dissection at a uh, proximal part of uh, LAD and with the, we found the large intramural hematome with the, we measure the size 2.5 or 30 millimeter. And we continue to predilatation with NC score flake balloon to fenestrate the intima and allowing the compression of the intramural hematome. And then uh, we put the long stem desk, uh, 3.038 millimeter, and we deploy 16 atmosphere. And this is the final result. We can appreciate here that the intramural hematome is uh, still present. However, the flow to distal LAD has uh, improved. And uh, we perform the OCT uh, post stenting. Uh, we found a well opposed and well expanded stand at proxima mid to distal part of uh, stand and no dissection and intramural hematome covered, uh, fully covered by stand. And we evaluate this patient uh, one month uh, later from the current angiography. We can see here, uh, we can appreciate here the intramural hematome completely uh, healing with a good distal flow and uh, stand place well, no lead complications in uh, angiographically. For the discussion, SCAD is non iatrogenic non atherosclerotic coronary artery dissection, resulting in the formation of an intramural hematome or false lumen in the coronary arterial wall. The true prevalence remains unknown. However, some study reporting that the prevalence between one to 4% of all HAS cases with the higher in the young to middle aged woman, especially below 15 years. And there are some condition that uh, can cause a triggering uh, or contributing for developing of uh, scat, some of emotional stress, medication uh, may be related with hormonal of in or intense exercise. And SCAD uh, classify into three types, where are the type one represent the radiolucent flap and linear double lumen, and type two uh, indicate the long lesion diffuse, and type three, uh, focal uh, lesion or focal stenosis. And here the 
suggested algorithm management of SCAD uh, proposed by uh, Dr. Song. When we face uh, the patient with SCAD and clinical high-risk features such as um, ischemia, cardiogenic shock, and sustained ventricular arrhythmia, uh, the vascularization should be considered, whereas the PCI uh, preferably uh, if uh, indicated uh, if visible. Uh, the operator uh, need to confirm that the coronary uh, wire is on the distal true lumen before we proceeding uh, to perform the angioplasty or uh, stenting. And we can use the guide uh, from intracoronary imaging such as OCT or IFUS uh, to confirm the uh, position of the wire. Uh, once the vessel is successfully wired, uh, there are many different technical options for angioplasty and or uh, stenting. For the conclusion, uh, the diagnosis and management of SCAD remains challenging. The recent development in angiographic characteristic and intravascular imaging have revolutionized our understanding of a SCAD. Uh, awareness of its high prevalence, especially in the middle-aged woman presenting with HAS in combination with the diagnostic world algorithm, will uh, aid to deliver an individualized treatment. And uh, OCT provides detailed visualization compared with other imaging modalities and may increase the diagnostic yield as well as guided treatment strategy. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your nice case. Uh, very educational and a good result. But uh, I, this patient is a very young uh, woman yeah. or okay. from the long stand. In the future, might be some concern, but uh, uh, I know that that situation is inevitable. So my question is, uh, once you found uh, uh, media dissection by OCT, how do you think uh, sports stenting or long stenting? Okay. How do you think? Yeah, okay. Uh, I think uh, we found the dissection it is a uh, detection from the OCT. From OCT, we can see the media dissection. So uh, we decided to put the long span uh, in case, uh, in order to prevent the, if we use the spot stenting, uh, we are afraid to propagate or maybe make some extension of the dissection. So we put the long stand uh, to fully cover the intramural hematoma. Mm -hmm. However, uh, yes, uh, what you said uh, before, it's maybe cause some problem. We should evaluate in the next time. Yeah, because sometimes the, that propagation is not usually uh, always occurred from the distally. Sometimes the proximally also the propagation yeah. makes some problem, uh, some yeah. case. Thank you for your uh, excellent presentation. I have a question. Uh, maybe OCT procedure is uh, increased the uh, uh, dissection site. How do you, why do you select uh, a choice OCT procedure in this case. Okay, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, we use the OCT. Actually, uh, we want to make a better or detailed visualization. As we know that the OCT has a better solution uh, and we can, can see the clear mechanism of the dissection. However, uh, there is some of limitation maybe we should be careful about the contrast injection when we perform the OCT. So it will make uh, more propagation of dissection. Can I comment? Yes, sure. Okay. Actually, the OCT uh, should not be used when acute ongoing pain is there, hemodynamically unstable situation, mm -hmm. or patients who have a cardiogenic shock, or if you are uh, distally, it's not open. So only pragmal tear is there still spreading. That time, if you right. do OCT, it can spread. But right. uh, if you have a in interomedial uh, plop, pragmally and distally, hemodynamically stable, no ongoing pain, that time, the well -est stabilized patient, that time you can do, because the high resolution image, you can see very clearly true and false human. You can see the landing zones pay to land. Here, yeah, there is no need to take the total uh, length. Only practically, you can uh, see where the internal tear, you can see the diagnosis. But uh, acute situation, IVS is preferable, but stable hemodynamically, yeah. the OCT. There are certain guidelines when to use the OCT, when to use the IVS, but when it's part of this coronary Thank you. Okay, thank okay, you thank for you. your comment. Mm -hmm.
Okay, so I think uh, we will have the close time. Okay, so uh, um, the, cha the chairman, the, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Francisco, recommend, uh, could you yes. uh, comment a closer uh, uh, remark? Please? Yes, uh, well, thank you all for this uh, excellent session. Uh, I think uh, all you learned a lot. And I want to thank the presentations, uh, uh, also my co-chair, Dr. Sun Ho, and all the contributions of the, our distinguished panelists. Uh, I want to thank also uh, uh, the scientific committee and the CBRF, and I wish all of you an outstanding and successful 26 TCAP uh, virtual 2021. And uh, for sure, uh, we look forward to see you soon, and uh, please take all of you care because uh, uh, we right. haven't resolved this pandemic issue yet. Thank right. you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you uh, for the participation all the presenter and the uh, discussant. Okay, so bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.